Welcome to Connecting a Better World, where we spend time meeting some of the most incredible human beings who make this world a better place. We will learn how each individual took their ideas, mission, and purpose to create and serve others in business and organizations that surround social good, social entrepreneurship, and social impact, and find out how we, together, can further connect others to help. I am your host, Dr. Natalie Phillips. Today, we will be talking with Dr. Judy Hutch, an audiologist in Tucson, Arizona. She is a mother, a wife, a humanitarian, and a woman who has an incredible passion to make impact in her industry, as well as in her community. Dr. Hutch was recently awarded the Woman of Impact Award for Southern Arizona, celebrating women in businesses changing the community, as well as received the Humanitarian of the Year Award from A.T. Still University at the American Academy of Audiology Conference in Columbus, Ohio, in recognition of her exceptional volunteer service. On today's show, Dr. Hutch shares with us her drive to serve others, along with her philosophy of changing the world, one person and one connection at a time. Today, I am so excited to introduce my friend, Dr. Judy Hutch, and she is a fellow audiologist, and I am excited because she is not only a mother and a wife and a humanitarian and an audiologist, but she is a woman who is just making a huge impact in our industry and profession of audiology, as well as in her community. So welcome, Judy. Thank you so much for having me here, Natalie. You're welcome. I want you to start telling the listeners more about who you are, what's your story. Let's start with your private practice in audiology, Oro Valley Audiology. When did you start your practice? Well, when I moved to Tucson, I went to work for an icon in audiology, Holly Hosford Dunn, and she kind of plucked me out of the Midwest and brought me to Tucson, and within six months, she gave me this choice. She was going to sell one of her practices to Sonus at that time. This was back in the 90s, and she asked if I wanted to be part of the sale or if I wanted to buy a second practice of hers that I had been running. I thought, well, I do not take direction very well from others, so (laughs) I think I will start my own and continue what she helped start, but I had only been working there a few months. And so within that time frame, I met the man that I was going to marry, and he's pretty much a native of Tucson. That was in 1996 is when the practice started. I purchased it in 1998, and I was a lone practitioner, did the the garbage and the billing and the calls, and I was it. And I did that for a few years and just decided at every opportunity, do I say yes, do I say no, or do I say not now? And I've always had a problem. I keep saying yes to everything. I hear you. (laughs) And so during all of those yes times, I opened a second practice. I had two boys. And thought, well, you better start hiring other people. And it just continued to grow. I was pretty insular for quite a while just to keep my head above water and the private practice. And then about five years ago, I needed more. And from that more, there's a story that my mother would always tell me. And she said, Judy, you are never going to be happy if you keep your gifts to yourself. She was right, so I tried to figure out how to give back in the community, and it's hard for private practice to funnel monies into the community while supporting Mm -hmm. a staff because all of my staff were women. They all had children. Most of them at that time saw their job as secondary to their husbands, and so it also was a goal of mine for them to see that this could be their career, this could be a game changer, this could be life changing for them and for others, for them to save their own money. So it started mostly with my own staff to making sure that these women were well taken care of. And then I came across Entheos, which is a cooperative, and they helped teach me 
how I could give back, how I could start my own nonprofit, and how I could travel the world to give hearing services. I've gone to four different places around the world so far, and my goal is 10, so (laughs) we'll see. So let's stop real quick and kind of go back to your office because I'm interested in that. And you said, yes, you wanted to take care of your staff, but did you make it a requirement for them to also give back? Did you match what they were giving back? What was sort of like your thought process and maybe even your program of how you started to implement this in your own practice? On the giving back I really led by example. I never required anybody to do anything. And it's also taken quite a few years to build the culture that I want for all of us to come up with our core values. Community outreach with all of us was very important. But I had decided that if I made it a requirement that people weren't doing it from their hearts and So I created opportunity, and they could choose to do it or not within office hours or outside of office hours. They really could decide and choose on their own. And some of them have flourished outside of the office and finding connections of, you know, doing more in maybe their church or their outreach, but then bringing the world of hearing and hearing loss into those places as well. The only part that I matched was their 401k. (laughs) I really wanted to make sure that they took care of themselves along as at the time of them taking care of others. Through those programs, one of the audiologists, she's developed a central auditory processing disorder test battery. We're one of two in Southern Arizona that do that testing and rehab. Southern Arizona is pretty large. She does it through the nonprofit, so we don't bill insurance. We just charge a small fee, and that program has grown quite a bit. Another one has decided to pick up the mantle for the hospice program, so anybody who's in the hospice, we test their hearing at no charge then give them either hearing aids or pocket talkers for the rest of their life so their communication is still there with the people around them. So people find what calls to them, and and when it's their choice, they pick up the mantle and and they run with it. It's more of a culture that you're trying to give the opportunity for your staff members to find something that resonates with them And then if the practice can get involved, they can bring it back to the practice. And it sounds like you help with the carry through of what their passion is or what they found. Yes, very much so. Because if they don't have passion in what they do, then it's a pretty miserable road. And everybody's a little bit different. Everybody has their own gifts. And so we really do try to find each other's gifts and let, let those shine. Talk to me a little bit more as you were talking before about MFAOs. How did you get involved? You said you sort of stumbled across of this audiology group. And what are you doing and where did you travel to? I had gotten an email. I ended up on a list some way and said, are you feeling burnout? Would you like to find more ways to give? And it just resonated with me. So I had called them up and I found out The word buying group is all over in everything medical right now. And I didn't want to do a buying group, but it was a cooperative. And they took their model actually from Do It Right Lumber. And they have a cooperative in the Midwest. But how do we come together to be the best, to have the practices, but also to give back because we were so blessed. And the first trip we took as a family, was to Zambia, Africa. And the boys were 14 and 16 at that time. And Rick went, I was in a back room testing hearing for three days. I barely saw them during the clinic time because they were busy growing and taking charge in their own areas. It was really wonderful to see. 
the boys, making ear molds and guiding people, playing with the kids so they had something to do because it's a long day for the people who come to the clinic because we look in their ears, we screen their hearing if they fail, we test their hearing, and if we can fit them with hearing aids, we do all of that in the same day. And in Zambia, we that trip, we saw just over 400 people and we fit 110 hearing aids. And then we would all go back. It was in the bush. It was in the Chimbombo district. And we worked with Fountain of Life, a nonprofit. Princess Zulu founded that. And we would just sit around the fire and then talk and connect. And it was, it was just a wonderful, wonderful trip. And since then, we've been back to Zambia. Um, we've gone to Jordan, where we worked with Syrian refugees. And we had refugees from quite a few other countries there as well. And my family will never forgive me, but I went to Turks and Caicos <laughs> by myself and left them at home. <laughs> and on that trip, we screened hearing for many children. And then in February, Rick and I went to South Africa, where we saw almost 1,300 kids wow. in three days. And so it's just something that fills my cup, and it makes me a better audiologist when I come back home. And I hope to continue to do one or two a year from now on. So it sounds like you go and you test the hearing, probably cleaners if you need to, and do the hearing test and then fit hearing aids. And then what's the follow-up like for these countries that you're visiting? We have a six to seven year plan when we're going in and the first step is relief and just to work with our ground nonprofits, our NGO, and to figure out what's the immediate relief. And then we, we move into how do we make this sustainable for that country in Zambia there was a gentleman, Sammy, who we've brought back to the U.S. and Otakon Foundation has helped train him. He was in the U.S. for four months and he travels from office to office learning how to be an audiology assistant and how to deal with the hearing aids because he lives in the Chibomba district. And in between trips, because Zambia, we only go once a year, People can come get batteries from him, have cleanings. We can troubleshoot. We can get parts to him because after seven years, we want to be able to be out of those countries and pick a new place, but just to make sure that we have the sustainability there on the ground and get them the supplies that they need. Where do the hearing aids come from, and do you raise your own money or funds to take these trips, like with your entire family, with your husband and your two sons? The hearing aids, they come from donations, but I have to say there's three partners that Entheos works with, and it's Widex, Resound, and Oticon. And they have stepped up to give us maybe one or two-year-old hearing aids, but they're very, very good hearing aids, and we bring those on the trips. And the challenging part is usually the power hearing aids. We normally have a great supply for moderate, moderately severe, but the severe to profound, those are the types that we really are needing. And so sometimes, because there's 30 practices across the U.S. that work on these trips, that we bring some of our own. Many of us have our own nonprofits. And we use them in our communities, but then we also bring them just in case on the trips as well. I have funded several of these trips for Rick and I between the business and personal. Mm -hmm. But the boys, I have made them (laughs) raise their own money. (laughs) Wow, that's Um, awesome. And the last trip to Zambia, they raised over $10,000. Oh, my goodness. Um, And... They didn't need all of that, so it's going back into the fund to, you know, help other students. We bring audiology students on the trips as well, so it goes back to help them too. So with my boys, I want to raise strong young men who really carry on 
our mantra of we don't want to give a hand out, we want to give a hand up. And that they are always there to make sure that they pick up the person next to them and make sure that they are always stand up young men. And I have to say, I really think they are. <laughs> oh, I love that. A hand up. It gave me chills. I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love that. And whether they're audiologists or not, you know, they're learning these, these opportunities that they're given at a younger age, so that it's going to be ingrained because things like this just don't, they don't forget, you know, and I took my son on a mission with me as well. And he does not stop talking about it. It's just one of those things that I love that you can start it early with your son's and to teach them that lesson of the hand up that they can take wherever they are going to end up. Because I know you and I talked about having sons and, you know, that they might not necessarily stay close to you. But it's these lessons when we have them under our roof that I think will go a long way. I do hope so, because I know they're not going to be audiologists. <laughs> but, and they can learn so much in these other countries as well because they're learning the difference between need and want. And when they were growing up, they think they needed so much. Right. But they found out they just wanted, they really didn't need very much. And it's been a great lesson to them. Yeah. And talk to me a little bit more about hearing the call. I know that you said it was part of it. So tell me a little bit more about hearing the call, the organization. So this is the nonprofit arm of Enteos and where we raise the money. Right now, you'll see a little bit of buzz. It's just starting up. We're bringing in Mandy Harvey, and she was one of Simon's top picks on America's Got Talent. And she's a deaf musician, singer. She plays the ukulele. She writes her music, but She has lost her hearing over the years, and she is one of the best role models of young people, and not so young as well, just hands down. She's a phenomenal woman. And so we're starting to do benefit concerts across the U.S. Another one that's helped us is Braden Baker, and he was on the Ellen DeGeneres show last year. He has helped raise over $100,000 and has gone on three mission or humanitarian trips, two to Guatemala and one to Zambia. And he's 11 years old. Oh, my goodness. So, but that's where people can donate to the international humanitarian work that we do. And I think in the next 12 months, you're going to see quite a bit of that. There's some pretty fantastic things in the work in we're really going to shine in the next 12 months. Wow. What sparked your interest into creating your own nonprofit? Because I know now you have your own nonprofit. And tell me more about Grace Hearing Center and how does it work and what was your idea behind it? Well, when I say I live in Tucson, Arizona, people will just think it's just such a beautiful spot, which it is. But we're also the sixth poorest metropolitan area in the United States. And it's a very have and have not. And I've been very, very blessed on the connections that I've made and the business that I've grown. But the stories of people saying, I just can't afford this. And that has just broken my heart. How do we figure out how to reach everybody? So I was going to do an an umbrella, a satellite nonprofit through Entheos, but I'm pretty impatient. (laughs) So Nora Stewart, after I was talking to her about the third or fourth time saying, where are we in the process? She just said, Judy, I think you're ready to do your own. I will help you, but you don't need a satellite. You need to do your own. So I created Grace Hearing Center. The word grace just embodies so many things. And both of my parents who have passed on, their favorite song was Amazing Grace. Mm. There's many, many stories of why I picked that name. So Grace Hearing Center was born. 
once it was corporation in Arizona, I thought, gosh, it's going to take the IRS about 18 months to clear me, so I've got time to figure all of this out. And so I sent it off, and two weeks later, I had a nonprofit. <laughs> wow. And I thought, well, I need to figure this out now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> One of the connections, I belong to three very powerful women's groups in Tucson. And women at the top, there was the CEO of El Rio Health Center, and that is the largest nonprofit health center. They have about 110 thousand enrollees and they're opening their 11th clinic this year and she and I were talking they also have the largest diabetes education program in the city as well so we started to screen people at one of their clinics and parallelly on my east side office I was seeing people who qualified we have a sliding fee schedule so we have to look into their financials But let's say if they're at 100% of the federal poverty line, maybe they'll pay $75 for reconditioned hearing aid, but they'll have 36 hours of community service. So they always have skin in the game some way. I love that. We're running. It's it's been fantastic. But I decided to sell that office. (laughs) During the time... I didn't want to put an imposition, even though the new owner was very open on letting us use a room one day a week. I just thought that that would probably be a bigger headache for her than she wanted. So in another women's group, the Women's President's Organization, somebody owned a building and they said, you know what? I have two rooms. We'll lease it for, and it really was peanuts. So we have two rooms in this really beautiful building that we can run Grace Hearing Center out of. And last year we fit 50 people with hearing aids. And we have an audiologist who we pay her, but we don't pay her what she's worth, I feel, right now. Mm -hmm. And she runs both the El Rio and the Grace. So she's working two days a week to keep that going. And at some point... I want to get another part-time audiologist and an audiology assistant so we can run that full-time. Wow. And it goes along with what you were saying before about what you're teaching your sons, which is so different from some of the other hearing nonprofits and other organizations that provide the gift of hearing, which is something that I loved hearing when I remember speaking to you earlier, is it's a hand up, you know, it's not a handout. And so not just giving hearing aids, but I love the part of what you said that they have skin in the game, like they have to still volunteer hours in addition to receiving hearing aids, the recipients of the hearing aids themselves. And I love that idea. There's more value to them. And of course, we will have situations that they will not be able to volunteer themselves. So then we ask if they have friends or family who can volunteer for them. And if that's not possible, then we do have community members who volunteer and bank the hours for somebody else. So it's an entire community. Wow. Takes a village, and so the awareness of hearing and hearing loss raises exponentially as well. So that's what we're working on, and I right. think we're creating a really beautiful community who know about hearing and hearing loss and the health conditions and hearing protection and all of that. That's great. What might be some of your favorite stories, or do you have a favorite story in all of these years that you have been given back in whichever organization it is? What's something that you carry with you that really kind of stopped you in your tracks and said, wow, you know, like this, this is why I do this? Well, two of them come to mind. The first one is Glenn was our very first patient through Grace Hearing, and he was 29 years old. He had the same hearing aid that he had since high school, I think, and the same ear molds. One of them didn't work at all. The other one barely worked. And he spent his days in his father's house playing Dungeons and Dragons. And he was not getting 
out and he was not keeping a job. So he was one of the very first that we fit and he did his volunteer work at Habitat for Humanity, their habit store. And within a year, he had a job. He was engaged to be married. His whole life just changed. And his father, for months, would call. And my office manager, who is a rock star with all of this, I could not do any of this without her. He would call Anne just how thankful he was to, you know, see his son be a member of society again. Mm-hmm. And so he's always going to have a special place in my heart. And then this last trip to Zambia, I tend to stick in the back and do the testing of the hearing. Many people like to sit the hearing aid because you get that beautiful hearing smile, right. that aha moment. And so a lot of audiologists like to go in there, but I usually in this, the back and There was one gentleman last year, I had turned 50 when I was in Zambia. And so I tested his hearing and he moved through. And then we found out the next day he was to turn 100. Oh, wow. (laughs) wow. Nora came and grabbed me and she said, you have to fit his hearing aid. You tested his hearing, you have to fit. So I did. And on many places, there's, of course, the language barrier, but... It didn't matter with him. It was just one of the happiest moments. And he was just a light. He was so dang happy. But turning 50 just made that much more special where I was, who I was with, and what I was able to do. Oh, I love that story. That's amazing. That's so amazing. You sound like this is just incredibly successful, but... What might be some help or connections that you might need to help push the needle forward in some of the organizations that you are working in to give back? With all of them, we need time, treasure, and talent from other people because at at different parts of our lives, we can do different things. And I would love to be able here locally, I would love to be able to expand There's two areas I would love to expand to, and that's to do an oncology program. Anybody who is going through chemotherapy, that we could fit them with hearing aids. I would love to start that. And I really need time and treasure and talent for that and telehealth. Because there are counties in Arizona that do not have an audiologist at all, and they really need help. So those are aspects that I really want to push forward. And internationally, it's the same thing, time, treasure, and talent. You do not have to be an audiologist. You do not have to know how to test hearing, or you don't even need to know anything about hearing aids. We just need people who want to give back. And if we're not able to give time or talent right now, then we will take the treasure. My husband, who's an architect, he still, after 23 years, really knows nothing about hearing aids. (laughs) (laughs) But he has helped figure out how the volunteers work and do a flow chart for them. He's very Mm detail-oriented. So he is giving his gifts as well. And it just takes the conversation. It just takes that connection. And we can always find a place for somebody to give in any capacity that they feel they can. And sometimes we can find, even if they don't think they can do it, we can match a little bit and and then they discover that they have even more to give than they ever dreamt possible. Yes, absolutely. You know, I'm always curious too, and I love sharing this part as well with the listeners, but what What drives you, yourself, to serve others? Because we can always be better, but I think the underlying philosophy for me is I hope every encounter that I have with a person leaves them a little bit better off than before they met me. I can't say that I'm like that when I'm behind the wheel driving, but I strive to make the world better, and that's That can only happen one relationship at a time. My parents 
they gave a lot, but they kept theirs under a bushel. You didn't always know everything that they did. And I hope to encourage others that it'll be a better world when we make it that way. I totally agree. You know, and what might be one piece of advice that you can share with our listeners as well? Because I feel that people who either tune into this or watch people doing some great things in this world, they always think, oh, that person's just special. Like, that's not me. Or I could never do something like that. What would be one piece of advice that you can share to encourage people to help make the world a better place? When I'm asking people in whatever capacity and they come back with, I don't feel I'm good enough or I don't have the time, then most of the time I come back, well, if not you, who? Mm. If everybody says we can't, then nothing will ever change. So that's in the back of my mind all the time when I bring more onto my plate. I would love to meet other people to pass the mantle on because they absolutely have the gift to do it. It's just sometimes they need the encouragement, even if it's just something small or one step. But truly, if it's not you, who will it be? I love that. That's so true. And it goes back to what you're doing in your own organization too. If you can't volunteer, then there's a replacement. There has to be somebody else out there that can volunteer for you for those hours, but you're carrying it through all the way to your belief system of everybody's got something. And even if you necessarily cannot come up with the idea right now or don't believe in yourself, there's someone close to you that you can get involved or you can suggest, or maybe that might be something that they partner together. I know a lot of people are afraid to do something themselves, encouraging them to find another person that will either stand in or that they can think of that's in their life. I think sometimes even when people have somebody close to them that they're watching, it might be easier to spark that fire in them as well. Right. And that's where mentoring and networking and building the relationships, how important those are. Because I don't know that I would have done a quarter or half of what I'm accomplishing now if it weren't for the mentors in my life or the people who just planted a seed and then helped me work it out, sounding boards and There's so many people inside and outside of audiology that have become wonderful sounding boards. You being one, I'm very appreciative of that. (laughs) And, And listening to the podcast as well, just to get other ideas too. And how could that help somebody else for them to spark their joy? Yep, I totally agree. Well, thank you so much. I don't know. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or cover that we didn't cover at all? I'm just very joyful that I've had this opportunity and I get to talk about all of this. It's just, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. 